All right, welcome to the future of Geek Panel. Thank you for coming out uh, this morning. My name is John Suntress. I host the War Balloon Podcast. All of these people have been on my podcast because they are incredibly smart and uh, are excellent analysts of the things we consume and of us as well. What do we like? You know, I mean, really, when you think about it, uh, 40 years ago, we might have been talking about CBs and uh, Farrah Fawcett posters and things like that. I think 20 years ago, we have been talking about variant covers and uh, the exploding direct market of comic books. 10 years ago, worried about where things are going and, and seeing DC and Marvel's numbers plummeting and are they gonna, you know, how are they gonna be able to hang on? Five years ago, are you gonna wanna read digital comics on your smartphone and on the screen this big? The geek market is ever changing and really we're in flux right now and that's why it's really great to have these people on this panel. Um, to my left, we've got Rob Southwoods, the author of Comic-Con and the Business of Pop Culture and also a columnist for ICB2 and uh, Business Analyst. Rob Southwoods, everybody. <laughs> Next to Rob, Heidi McDonald, the blog The Beat. She's the creator, uh, editor-in-chief, and a mass major contributor, or main contributor to The Beat, and also a Publishers Weekly, uh, both online and uh, the podcast publishers. with the more to come. The uh, PW Comics with more to come. Heidi McDonald. That is Tim Byers of The Motley Fool, uh, the uh, financial analyst site. Tim is a guy that analyzes what uh, the studios are doing and the publishers and uh, does amazing analysis work of the deep market. Tim Byers. <laughs> I'm just here to traffic out because uh, really these are the people with the information that we're all interested in. What does make up the deep market? Where is the deep market now in 2014? And again, in the future. And uh, Rob uh, has had access to some very interesting data, and I'll let Rob get into it. Sure. So, so three of the things that we're going to talk about in this panel um, involve, you know, sort of a three-legged stool of what is fan culture these days. Um, there's the entertainment industry, there's the publishing industry, what's going on, and who's buying the, the media itself. But then there's this. There's this whole idea of fandom conventions and fandom events. And I would say, of, of all of these things, the emergence of fandom events as a, as a huge driving force in what's going on in, in, you know, in fandom at, at large was the hardest thing to predict, I think, a couple of years ago. Because you know, we would have this event, San Diego Comic Con, which was the center of gravity where all of this crazy stuff was happening. But now what we're seeing is that practically every weekend of the year, we're getting a show that's selling out its capacity, is getting you know, 40, 50, 60,000 people. When I started coming to San Diego Comic Con in 1997, it was about 40,000 people, and it was the biggest show I had ever seen. And now it's going to be, you know, 40,000 might not even be the biggest show that week. <laughs> so that's really interesting. And in the last um, uh, six months or so, I've uh, been doing some business with Eventbrite, the online ticketing platform, and they do all kinds of events. How many people here do this event, right? Right? So, so it's a, you know, it's a familiar name and it's, you know, in music and sports and, and other kinds of events. They were looking at this market for fan events and looking at the numbers at it and they're going through the roof. Triple digit year over year increases in the last three to four years, outperforming just about every events category that they measured. And in fact, at the end of last year, they did a, a market sizing survey of a thousand different fan events around the country. Um, and determined from that this is in video games and comics and anime and specialty fandoms, things like that. And they determined that in gross ticket sales alone, that this is approximately a $600 million market in North America. Just for context, the entire comics publishing industry, uh, ICB2 just came out with market sizing for that, it was about $875. For publishing all up, that's trade, periodicals, and digital. And, and the graphic novel industry was about $600 million, probably about three years ago. So, so the, um, uh, so the old joke about that there's more people coming to comic cons than are reading comics, that is almost true on a dollar for dollar basis. And then if you look at the economic impact of these cons beyond ticket sales, so every time a con finishes in, you know, WonderCon or a con in Pensacola, Florida that gets, you know, 2,000 people, um, you know, or uh, Denver or some of these other big shows, they, they, the Chamber of Commerce or somebody does an economic assessment to figure out what is the impact of those cons. 
and those can range from you know two or three million dollars in local economic impact for one day show to something like San Diego Comic Con that generates something like two hundred million dollars for this weekend for the city of San Diego. It's at one hundred and seven million dollars this this weekend. This weekend, okay, because I've seen I, I've seen one hundred and sixty three, but that was a couple of years ago. So I um, I think the sky's the limit when it comes to San Diego. So if you take a multiple of like gross ticket sales and attendance, and a conservative multiple would be like five or six times. Well, if this is six hundred million dollar ticket business. This is probably a you know five to seven billion dollar economic uh, opportunity just in conventions. So with all of this going on, you know we wanted to find out who's coming to conventions, who are the who are all of these people, where did all of these people come from. And then also to uh, find some data, because the panel is all about data, and I know Heidi has some really good stuff from... Yeah, I, um, we also went and, um, I wish we could show it to you, but we're talking about it. Um, we also, uh, uh, actually I didn't do it, um, one of uh, my colleagues named Brent Schenker, who actually does um, political uh, demographic studies, so he went on Facebook and he looked at the numbers. And I mean, what Rob's talking about is like the numbers growing. I, I'm sure that that um, Tim will talk about that too in terms of financials. But what uh, Brett really did with his research was just show that you know on Facebook, millions, like 24 million people, were liking terms that had to do with comics. Now that doesn't mean they all bought comics. It means, but that means they were comics aware. I mean, it's a pretty big universe. And, um, you know, I'm sure, also that the demographic makeup is changing very, very quickly. And I mean, I am a 30-year veteran of Comic Con. This is my 30th Comic Con. And you know, when I came, I will be honest, uh, there were not very many people like me in that I went to Lady Troll. And so, you know, now uh, the statistics that that we have show that it's almost 50-50. And now that's true because there's such a long line for Lady Troll. So. Um, <laughs> Honestly, it, I was kind of shocked yesterday. I was like, wow, don't wait for the last minute. But, um, but you know, this is a huge, huge, um, like, change in, and not just cons, but I mean, how entertainment companies are thinking. I mean, when I went to the, to the DC booth yesterday, they actually had a, um, you know, set up for the clothes that they sell at Hot Topic for female fans. And, and they had a display of some of the, the, the women's clothing there, and I mean, which is kind of unheard of at the DC booth. You know, normally it is boy things for, for boy boys. So, I mean, and, and other things, you know, Lady Four and so many other demographic things that are happening are just, you know, I don't even know. It's a tidal wave, and I don't even know where this is going. And anybody, so. anybody with two eyes who's been watching this space for the last couple of years can see this happening. And yet, you know, when you walk the floor, um, one of the reasons that we wanted to collect this data is, you know, I work in marketing, and uh, there's, a, there's a term called big data that's going around in marketing right now about the way that they're collecting all this stuff. And people say, oh, big data is creepy. You know what's, you know what's creepier than big data? Big ignorance. <laughs> and there's a ton of ignorance around what's going on here because people say, oh, okay, women are coming to cons, but they're just here for cosplay and they're not spending money or they're not fans of the same stuff that we're fans of, or little girls don't buy toys the same way that boys do, and stuff like that. These are myths that have circulated that undermine the, the obviousness of the demographic shift, and it's like a sort of a, it's a last line of defense for the, for the old culture, and that we need better data yeah, to, well, uh, to... And now we have it. And now we have, now we have, have it. Yeah. 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 Technology. 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 While we're offering, yeah. you know, we were saying, uh, we were talking uh, at the Image Expo, and you were telling me about her universe and right. the opportunity right. that right. they have shown that, that the women's market for geek merchandise is Absolutely. much bigger than but, any of these yeah. licensed stores. Oh, on. yeah, and I mean, I think it took companies like Black Milk and her universe to really, and you know, which are women driven companies, to get in there and um, show that, that there was a market for this and, you know, through their products. But, I mean, now it's like you go to the mall and everywhere. I mean, I don't know if it's just for Comic-Con or whatever, but I mean, H&M has Batman tights and, you know, every single store has this geek merchandise or geek merchandise for women and, um, I mean, it's, it's universal, so. 
There you go. See, look how that we did. Hey. Oh, hey. That was Comic Con. Hey. As we all know, Comic Con like, has become this mass phenomenon. I'm sorry. I'm just going to show you the playing while it's happening. It's going to take a little while. It's an awesome actor. Um, in any case, um, so the, what the data not only proved out some of this gender stuff, it also, um, there were some very interesting things about the changing shape of family. So um, we tend to think as, as longtime fans that if we're fans of comic books, maybe not so much fans of video games, maybe not so much fans of anime and, and uh, uh, manga, uh, you know, or Oz or My Little Pony or, or, or what have you. And yet, when we did this fan survey, and we gave people an opportunity, this is our big infographic, um, sort of dive into this. When we gave fans an opportunity to web comics and online. So we gave people a pretty wide range of stuff to say, I'm a super fan of this, I buy this stuff, I know all about it, versus I'm kind of into it, versus not into it. Our survey respondents identified as super fans of at least three categories of fans. So that means that all of the money that these entertainment companies are spending in trying to pull audiences together across video game platforms, across movies, across comics, and everything like that, is working. And also that these conventions are really becoming melting pot, where you walk in here maybe as fans of one thing, and you leave as fans of other stuff. Um, so that was kind of an interesting thing. Here's the gender numbers. In the poll, our overall response rate was 55, 45 uh, male, female. Um, and the people who identified as super fans of certain genres uh, were more heavily male. For example, video games were more heavily male than comics. Comics is, and then we get anime and manga, just about 50, 50. Here's an interesting one. This is age 30 and under. That was about half our, half our sample. Exactly 50-50, within three responses of 50-50. Right? That is the future of fandom right there, that, that chart. Yeah, 30 and under, exactly. Right? Yeah. And the older it gets, the more skewed male it gets. So. But we're dying off, so <laughs> it, it, it's representing those older three, so it's okay. I always stay over. And then uh, also, just to, just to quickly go over some of this stuff, so this is some of the spending data. So this is how much people spend in different channels on their fan interests per year. And as you get into this data, it's actually pretty interesting also about you know, who spends what. You know, do, do female cosplayers spend money on stuff? Hell yes. <laughs> the number one, in fact, the number one, when people were asked why they come to cons, the number one answer was to buy stuff that we like, 70%. Next, next highest was to see celebrities and meet creators, 53%. And that spending number at 70% holds high across everything. Because now, yesterday I was down on the floor and I was talking to a bunch of retailers and they're like, oh, there's all these people here and they're not buying stuff. Well, they're media consumers, but they're not collectors. And that's where, the, that's where some of the difference is coming. And I think that a lot of the exhibitor population down there is used to selling to collectors. And what we're getting is people that are happy to spend money, whether online, in physical locations, or on the con floor. I mean, there is more than 100,000 doesn't show up on the chart, but there was, there was, a, there was a, a response set for that. Um, so there's people still dumb. But I, you know, just to, to expand on that a little bit, I mean, I think it's here, especially the exclusives. I mean, I think, uh, I mean, this is absolutely, I was just having a conversation before I came to this panel with a retailer friend of mine, and he was wondering why more publishers don't do exclusives. Like all of the means, well, excuse me, um, all of the superhero and um, horror genre publishers do do exclusives, but some of the smaller, more literary, let's say graphic novel publishers don't do exclusives. You know what? They are leaving money on the table. There is no reason why they can't cash in on this you know, this thirst for, for, for special things. Yes, right. And, and I think this also speaks to why we have entered, I, I think it's fair to say we have entered the franchise era. And the, the franchise era is simply that, you know, you start something, you know, you start a movie, it becomes a video game, it becomes a comic book, a comic book becomes a TV show, and on and on and on. And the reason they're doing this is there are people who have seen this kind of data and Rob, you've been talking about things like, you know, trans media, and there is a, there's enough of a hunger 
for properties, for franchise properties, that they can sell across these different uh, categories. And that is, that's the magic. Now, unfortunately, there's some engineering. There's, they're, they're trying to engineer this a little bit, and that's where it goes wrong. But there are legitimate organic franchises that are just killing them. It also looks like uh, that argument of online versus Main Street as far as retailers. It's nice to see that local businesses are represented well. Yeah. And that, you know, really as record stores and, and some of the stores fade away, that, you know, stores that cater to the gay culture seem to be thriving. Yeah, and the message here is that, you know, like for the exhibitors, the people that come to these cons to, to set up shop, the people walking the aisles are your customers. They will come to your store after the con is done. They'll spend money in your booth, and then they'll go to your website and buy some more stuff. So, and again, it's once you cut these numbers up, you know, under 30, over 30, video gamers versus comic collectors, or, or that sort of thing, uh, you know, a lot of these spending patterns are uh, the same. Obviously, the higher the income, the more the spend. But uh, going to uh, Tim's point, um, you know, one of the big things that's been driving con culture is this convergence of, of uh, of media. And so one of the things that we surveyed in this is who are the people that will come to the opening day weekend? 25% of con attendees always, always come to the opening weekend for something that they're interested in. They'll pay extra for IMAX or 3D. Um, so the studios that are marketing, they're spending money to market to people to get people in. These are the people buying the expensive tickets that are making that return on, on marketing investment pay off the highest. Uh, this is the con audience. They'll pre-order stuff. Some of them will even subscribe to a specialty service like Netflix just to get the fan-oriented content that's exclusive to those platforms. So, uh, and they're, the, they're the brand ambassadors. This is why these guys are so important. So for every film that you know has sort of crossed over and become so, uh, you know, The Avengers goes from a comic book film to $1.5 billion worldwide. That starts with brand ambassadors, that starts with fans, that starts here. Um, you know, people who are uh, investing early. And I, you know, I've heard publishers talk about this, you guys can probably tell you, you know, I've heard this too, where, you know, they, in, in publishing and even in toys, there's like this R&D sense. We're gonna try some things, and then when we see some success, we try to move it to, to other media. Um, and some of it works, when it's engineered, it really doesn't, but we're seeing it increasingly. Just a, a stat on this that I think is kind of staggering, Disney has probably done this better than most. If you look at the total dollar volume of licensed imprints that are just Walt Disney, um, it is more than 40 billion annually. That is more than double anybody else. I mean, it's, it's a crazy number. That, that's not what Disney makes. That's just what they're responsible for. But consumer products, which is about $4 billion a year of business, has the highest margins of Disney. Why is that? Because all they're doing is writing contracts. They just say, we would like to use Spider-Man on our t-shirts. Great, here's the contract, start sending us checks. And so you have that, you know, how would you like that job? You know, your job is to cash checks that come from people who license your images. I want that job. Well, the top 10 license, license product properties have always been like Disney is, is number one. Um, and then it varies, but I mean, Marvel has shot up, so I think that they're number three now. Yeah. Um, I, you know, United Media, which does a lot of comic strip merchandising, is always on there, Warner Brothers, of course. And, um, you know, I think there's some clothing licensing brands that are on there, but uh, those, I mean, it really is, I mean, you talk about, the, you know, geek dominance. I mean, in the licensing world, it's become bigger and bigger and bigger and more dominant. Yeah, and, I, and then when you bring that back to the convention culture, I mean, one of the other things is as these cons become mainstream events and people bring their families here and stuff like that, I remember the first time I was walking down the street and I saw like a Green Lantern logo on a feature in like 2005 or something like that, and I thought, wow, that's pretty deeply managed to just be walking the streets here. And now it's like it's easier to not see them than to see them. I mean, there's so, much, there's so much of that stuff, so all of this licensing revenue that's, that's driving through this, I think, that these cons serve as a focal point where everybody comes and flies their colors and and mainstreams this stuff into uh, into the broader consumer culture. And you know, when we talk about the future of geek, you know, one of the questions is, can it get any bigger, or you know, has it saturated? And you know, it, it, like, will the bubble burst? Yeah. You know, and is it still special? So, um, the, my last thing is uh, just uh, anybody in here that is an events organizer. So these cons are big business. They're 
So this is some note. So we gave people the option, do you like your cons bigger the better? Do you say, big cons are lots of fun, but can also be stressful, and there was more to that question. I wish they were better organized. Yeah. Right, majority agreement on that, and then there's a, a, there's a growing number that says, big cons are too busy, I'm sticking to smaller events, or I'm done with cons until it's gone. So that, that slice of the pie is small, but you need to watch it. This big slice of the pie, the, the, uh, the green slice that says, they're stressful, they can be better organized, um, this is, you know, this is where the war is going to be won and lost on this stuff. So, um, and that number gets higher the more frequently. So the people who go to four or five times a year are more likely to agree with that, and the people who spend more at times are more likely to agree with that. So, um, if you want to please your best customers, um, tighten up on, on that stuff because, uh, like we, we, Heidi and I have been discussing, there's been some con disaster stories in the last couple of years. Yeah, and I mean, there are, I just, again, literally, as I was talking to this panel, um, I ran into a convention organizer from France, and he had told me about the show uh, when I was there, and it's very well established, but he's like, oh, we have to move our dates because someone else uh, moved in on us. And so, uh, and, and he said their competition in, in France is now so steep. Everybody, every because of the, the, these kind of numbers that you're showing, everyone is jumping in on this space, and they think, oh, it's easy to run a con, and it turns out it's not that easy. And I mean, I, I think you're absolutely right about the disgruntled fan. Um, I mean, the majority here does have some kind of like, like my fun comes with a stress factor thought here, so. San, San Diego is a special case. Yeah, but I, but I do think people are like, I mean, they are, they sell out. I mean, the most, the, uh, the lot of shows now, uh, New York is already sold out, um, Emerald City sells out in advance, so those are the uh, three biggest ones in America. I'm not sure about Toronto, which is the, uh, the uh, Fan Expo, which is actually the third biggest one in North America. I believe that show also sells out, so, I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Too. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Like Southwest, yeah, really. And, and even Salt yeah. Lake. Yeah, yeah. Seattle yeah. represent. Yeah. Every yeah. city is here yeah. as well. I mean, if, you, if you find uh, that San Diego Comic Con is too much fun and not stressful enough, like, <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, well, there's a lot of great shows that are, um, you know, yeah, New York, we definitely know how to do it. Um, I think we have, yeah, you know what? We have While you're looking at that, I wanted to ask Tim, and you mentioned Netflix. Um, you know, Hulu is getting into the streaming, you know, or they are in the streaming video yeah. business. Amazon's doing it, PlayStation. As these separate platforms creep up and they all have exclusive content, yeah. what is the breaking point for the consumer? It's kind of like cable in terms of, all right, I'm spending, you know, 10 bucks a month on Hulu, 10 bucks a month on Netflix. You know, can the market sustain all these different platforms? Well, the way this is always broken out is it's broken out by you know what you what you like. So you're going to go to you're going to go where you like. The network is completely secondary, especially now because things have become so disconnected. It's very easy. The switching costs between networks are not what they were. If you had when you say switching costs, switching costs meaning if uh, you know Time Warner had a certain show that you really liked, and you had Time Warner cable, but in order to get that show, you had to switch over to Comcast. Okay. That's huge, you know, but that's, that's not true anymore. Uh, you can get most of the stuff that you want, like via Netflix. And that, one of the great advantages of Netflix, what they did very intelligently, I think, is, uh, and, and this is their advantage, this is still true about them, they are more present on platforms worldwide than any of their competitors. It's not even close. They're on every type of gaming device. They're on every type of set-top box. They're available on every network, and on every cable network. So I think distribution has a, has a lot to do with it. And that's why if you are a, a content provider, uh, you are going to go where the distribution is, and that allows Netflix to strike some deals. So there is some risk for you know, things like Hulu, uh, YouTube to, to a lesser degree, but smaller, you know, smaller distribution outlets uh, have it a little tougher. One of the, I think one of the seminal moments from was last year that uh, the, uh, the season four, uh, yes it was, it was season four of The Walking Dead, Dish Network and AMC were embroiled in a contract fight, you guys remember this, it was a big fight over what's called retransmission fees. If you know what re retransmission fees essentially mean that it's my stuff, if you want to retransmit it, you have to pay me. And 
You know, AMC wasn't liking the deal that Dish wanted to give them. So they said, fine, we're not going to do it. And then they started uh, putting it out. And they put out the premiere. I think they broadcast it live online. Uh, and Dish didn't get it. And after the first episode, they said, whoa, no, we don't want any more of this. <laughs> and then uh, a deal got done. Who yeah. said that, AMC or Dish Network? Dish Network. Oh, they so they did it, and they, 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 they got a deal done. So I mean, they talked about it. Distributor who was trying to drop off access to the content provider who could mobilize their audience and say, hey, give us what we want through the way that we want it. Right. It, 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 has, wow. it, it shifted selectively. It hasn't shifted completely. It has to be the, the right content. But that's certainly true. I just want to mention a, a, a stat to, and, and let you guys key off on this because there is a public company that does conventions. It's Anybody heard of Wizard World? Yep. <laughs> So Wizard World is, is a public company. It's a penny stock. If anybody is, is really interested in this, it's, uh, the ticker is WICD. And you can look this up yourself, because any, you can look up any public company. You can look up all the data you want at the SEC Edgar database. And if anybody doesn't know what that is, you can find me. I'm at Wild High Fool on, on Twitter, and I, I will happily show you how to do it. But these are some numbers from Wizard World. This is the most recent 10Q, which is a quarterly report. So 5.2 million in overall convention revenue, that's up from 1.8 million year over year. More than triple. So operating income, uh, 692.2 million versus 126.1 million. So up 5X, all over 5X. So not only are conventions bringing in more revenue, but they are doing, it's more of it is flowing to the bottom line. They're getting some leverage out of it, which explains why Wizard World is going to 22 shows next year. 22 shows in, in 2015. So yeah, this is a very big business. And, and there is a lot of pushback against that because of some of the markets they're going in, as I was saying with the French situation, where, you know, there are, uh, you know, I have a category on my blog called Condors, and uh, I hate to say it, I mean, there was a period where it was very intense, and then there was a period of great peacefulness in the universe. And I hate to say it, but we are going to see a lot more concourse. Yeah. Um, there's going to be a lot more competition, and uh, some people will do things that are uh, unpleasant, and they're going to be, I think, people taking sides. That's where it's not a reality show. I hope not, but that, that might be incredible. Um, I'm going to throw up some. Family <laughs> <Yes>. events. <laughs> I, these are not my statistics. I am not a statistician. Um, so again, Brent Schenker did these uh, from graphicpolicy.com. But I, I think they do. Um, he does like Facebook research. And Facebook, it, if you may think it was made to share photos of your niece, but it really was created to be a marketing tool for advertisers. So it's very accurate and it's very sophisticated in how they give you their uh, marketing demographics, which is how he. Um, went in there, and so he's been doing this for over a year, and he has, you know, he tracks how the terms change, uh, but it's become more accurate um, here. And so, just what he says with DC and Marvel, in, he, we're going to compare 2013 and 2014. Uh, so the numbers in 2013 are global statistic. In 2014, he was able to um, make it uh, just just America, uh, US stats. So these are the 2013 stats. And um, these are just, you know, these are very broad demographic numbers of people on Facebook. Um, you know, people who like comics terms, people who like DC comics, people who like Marvel, and then people who like indie down at the bottom. Um, so, and I, to me, what, what is, of course, fascinating about this is the gender issues. Because uh, for years, there has been no good updated demographic info that talks about the gender breakdown of fandom. And I mean, I can see with your own eyes, if you come to shows, you see the number of women increasing, the lines of the ladies are getting longer and longer and longer. But you would still see, um, DC Comics did a survey a few years ago where it said 7% of their readers were female. And I mean, that just did not pass the eyeball test, you know? And so these numbers, although they're raw, but they give, like with raw statistics, it's, it's within this 60, 40 to 50, 50. The number is always between 40 to 50 percent. You know, so it's within five points, uh, as they say. So, uh, but you can see that comics, for comics, it's 60, 40. For DC Comics, it's 70, 30. Uh, for Marvel, it's, it's 75, 25. But, but, you know, we're seeing like a, more than 7 percent. 
here. <laughs> and actually for indie comics, it's it's pretty close. It's it's again within that, that 50. So and here's 24. So so actually some of the numbers have dropped, but but they're still within that that golden uh, range. But the one that's really gone up is Marvel. But uh, again, this is US, not versus worldwide. You can see Marvel, it's it's 63, 36. So it's 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 significantly gone up in that. I'd love to see that slice. Yeah, yeah. These are yeah. These are some some rough numbers, and uh, I'm not sure you can do age on Facebook. But but yeah. Is this just based on likes? I mean, what actual Facebook? These are these are you know uh, Brett is going to explain these on his own site and on my site. So we'll explain them a little bit more. I am talking about just as rough, but he has a bunch of terms. It's not comics, as in oh, I like. You know, he has a bunch of search terms that he has that are names of, of companies, characters, that terms that, that he considers valid that refer to comics. And then it is literally likes, okay? So we had so much pushback as soon as we introduced these these numbers, you know, because you know, I'm a little snarky. I mean, and these guys are a lot better numbers than I am, but I'm like, oh, a sample of 24 million people. I mean, there's gotta be a really high, you know, variance in that. So um, but, uh, you know, there is, what these numbers are saying is not that 24 million people buy comics. That's not true. 24 million people don't go to conventions, okay? What it is saying is that 24 million people are aware of and consider themselves uh, enough of a comics knowledgeable and think of it favorably enough to push that like button. You know, they are comics friendly. It is a market that can be approached, okay? It's a potential audience, it's not an actual buying audience. And that's what a lot of people said. Because this, you know, I, I, with the event records, I mean, I have gotten so much pushback on these figures that they don't possibly believe there can be this many women who like comics and nerd culture. I mean, in my comments on my Twitter. Are you talking about publishers? Yeah, no, no, I just mean like, readers. like, like readers, and like fans, readers. And like, like other, other people who I'm probably guessing are older fans who feel that somehow threatened by this idea. You know? That's insane. It is insane. <laughs> it is insane. But I will tell you that some of these older fans may still be in positions of power at certain companies. And so this is why numbers like raw numbers, like the Eventbrite numbers, the research that that uh, Brett is doing is so important. And because this is, I mean, this I feel open the floodgates. I feel like this this number something happened because okay. it changed. Well, I mean, the smart publishers, IDW and Boom, and uh, you know, I was talking about IDW last week. On Saturdays, I go into my comic store, and it is full of little girls going to buy their My Little Pony. Absolutely, absolutely. Right? Little girls in a comic store buying comic books from a publisher is like, in 2014, this is like a revolutionary idea. This market, this market has not been properly served by U.S. publishers in like 35 years, and it's not DC and Marvel that's doing it. It's IDW, it's Boom. So the money spends, it's just who's going to be smart enough to isn't part of that though because the focus for DC and Marvel and more importantly Warner and Disney, the, the TV and movies and comics really are part of research and development, you know, and, and you know, I mean, where are comics placed well, in those two companies these days? You know, actually, I mean, Tim, you should answer this more depth, but just one, one line. It's yeah. like Disney bought Marvel to go to boys. Right. That's right. And that's exactly, and, and it's been very successful. But, you know, what's so crazy about the idea that the TV and movies are driving, you know, boys is that it's exactly the opposite. You know what made uh, Captain America the Winter Soldier such a huge hit is because it had a really great female co lead in Black Widow. There's a huge outcry for, you know, a Black Widow film. There is a huge, if you look at just search data, there's a huge amount of fan interest in a Wonder Woman film. We can't figure out how that isn't getting done when we have, <laughs> I, I mean, I love Rocket. There is nothing, I, I can't wait to see the little raccoon with the giant guns blowing people away, Guardians of the Galaxy, don't get me wrong. But, I, it, it's amazing to me that there's pushback on a Wonder Woman film when you can put, you know, Rocket Raccoon and, and Groot 
on, you know, on, on film and there is a real fan base for it. So it's not a legitimate argument. It's an absurd, like Heidi said, it is an observable phenomenon that there are female fans that are spending real money that are engaging with TV and movies. I, I mean, I, I don't have as much access to the comic, comics data, but it's absolutely true. So the real test will be tomorrow when we get to see more of what Marvel's movie slate is. There should be, I, I think most people are, who observe these, these companies are expecting that there will at least be Black Panther and Black Widow. And if not, I think somebody needs to ask Kevin Feige why. Hey, what are you waiting for? What are you Absolutely. waiting for? You know, I see we're running out of time. I just yeah. want to see if there's uh, you know what, let me just, yeah, I think this is, this is, just quickly, just so anybody wants to take a picture of it, just so you can see the difference in the, in the, this is the numbers, how they went down. Um, I'm not going to talk about them, but yeah, let's, um. And as you're, as you're bringing that up, we do want to get some more questions if you have yeah, as well, so. Yeah, we'll tweet these out. And while you're doing that, yeah. I'll take the question real fast, sir.
something though, because I think with the internet we're seeing the actual people being heard instead of ideas that aren't exactly legit. Three more questions. Three more questions. Three more questions. Batman, Superman, sure. Woman, and Supergirl back in the early So was I. Yeah, we all were. Huge amount of older people who grew up with this, continued with this, came back with it. And you're right, I do nothing with Dark Horse. They're in a lot of stuff to the women. And that's the only way to get it out. There you go. Yeah. I've got this lady first, and then I see three more, so go on. So I'm very interested in your data about the growth of animals. And obviously, we can argue that a lot of that is driven by kind of niching traits. But I think in Comic Con, especially what we're seeing a lot is It, it, you know, and it's a good question. I mean, Scott Pilgrim is the famous one. It's off-sited. Um, and, it, it, you know, what they figured out is that even though this is where you engage, there's no such thing as automatic success here. You know, you need to, you know, you need to have a good marketing budget. You need to be, you know, in, in places. You have to have a good distribution. You know, but it was a cult kit. Uh, and, you know, I like Scott Pilgrim a lot. But the way studios approach Comic-Con, uh, and why they, they invest here is because they're not just thinking about the movie, they're thinking about the franchise. And this is where franchises get built, if that makes sense. Because here, so Lionsgate is a good example downstairs. If you go, Lionsgate actually may have the most brilliant strategy at this con right now in terms of the studio. Because what they're doing is instead of trying to take over Hall H, they have exclusives, like Heidi was talking about. You go, and it, it's a huge fan rush for the exclusive. If you want to get you know, footage for the new Mockingjay, you have to go to their Samsung event. So Samsung is paying Lionsgate so that they can market their film. Lionsgate is a brilliant yeah, company, um, but it is about the franchises. So if you, if you expand your thinking, if you want to think like what a, a studio executive, how they're approaching this, they're like, this is where we put the stake for the big franchise. Yeah. Sir in front. All right, so you're talking about expansions of the brand other cons. I'm curious what you guys think of the expansion of this con, and where do you think that is? Where, where is it going now with more people versus technology? Where would you like to see it? Well, the, I'm looking over the other panels, but just I'll say real quickly that this con is the first year that it's plateaued, for sure. There is definitely, um, because it's selling one day badges, because they're giving out, um, wristbands, they changed a lot for this year, and it tamped it down, you know, and a lot of studios, I think Universal was here, right? right. And they were the ones who famously did Scott Pilgrim and Cowboys and Aliens, so. I'd go so far as to say it's not only Plexo, that we may actually be a little bit on the back slope, and we'll have, I'm going to see how the weekend plays out, but this definitely feels, for the first time, not just like the same as last year, but a little a little off, little off peak. Yeah, yeah and, I, and, I, and I agree. I'd say the the Hall H stuff is it, because it's so hard to, to get into Hall H, and it, it essentially has a reputation of it's impossible to get into Hall H. I, I think that is a uh, it's a detriment. It makes it hard to convince a studio executive to spend big money to be in Hall Real H. Fast. Now, I'm curious, what do you think um, technology-wise would be smart for them to construct streaming? Where it's not showing the content, but showing the conversations. They do. Yeah. A lot of cons do that already. Yeah. Do, do you think that that will ever be something that's able? Because it's, I mean, it's always on the survey. It's always on the survey. Would you, would you like that to happen? And I keep hoping that the last survey. I'm going to say, in five years, we're going to see a very different con. Okay. Remember, San Diego is a nonprofit event, so they're, so they're mission focused. I think you're going to see some of that stuff in the commercial cons before you might see it here. Yeah. Uh, is Facebook sort of where the data capture is at, or is there a move to branch out into other social media sites to try and capture that demographic information? Um, I, I'm, I'm sure that Brett is actually telling me about Twitter stuff, so, I mean, that's what he does for a living. He, he does this as a hobby, so, uh, you know, I mean, just plug my site, comicsbeat.com. I mean, I'll be putting it up there, so. Just go under demographics on there, because we do a lot of, I, I love this kind of stuff, so. Actually, we pulled for that in, um, in our uh, Eventbrite survey, and it turns out that Twitter is the least used platform. It's the, it's the least used as a regular platform, it's the least used as a casual platform, and it's the most, like, I don't use that at all. Among all of the families that we surveyed, 
Um, the biggest things that we saw is that women blog like five times more than guys. Like that's their main channel. And podcasts, because like, there's sometimes here the great word women podcast. Um, that those actually do male by about two to one. Men love to talk when the women write. You podcast. Tell me good stuff. Yes, Hi, uh, Two things. Um, what you said about Winter Soldier about how the female market drove the movie. I was, I was under the impression that it was just a really well done film and a great story. I saw it three times. I, I love well, it. There's no doubt that's true. That's and good too. secondly, I mean, does the male dollar matter? Because I, I hear all this emphasis <laughs> on trying to get the female dollar. And no offense to anybody, but it seems like anything that's embraced by guys, there's this, there's this need to bring women into it. But yet, something that's embraced by women, I don't see, you know, like, you don't see people trying to get men in Twilight, not that we want to get into it, but it just... <laughs> you know, it's wonderful. It's just like, it just seems like to me it's un unbalanced. It's just like, you know, yes. I kind of think let the chips fall But, but they've already got our money. I mean, I think that's the thing. They've already got our money. You know, and, and it really is to show that the market can expand in, in areas that they have, you know, dismissed for decades. And I mean, just to, you know, I know we're out of time, but just to quickly wrap this up, it's like, you know, my whole life I've been told, like, you know, that women don't read comics. And then I'm like, what is this in my hand? You know, like, well, am I a hero or a weirdo, you know? So, so, I mean, that's what it's really about to me. It's just like saying, you know, you know what, the male dollar is fine. And like, boy, it's, you know, Transformers, you could have that. I am, but I know women like it, you know? And there are guy things and there are girl things, for sure. But a lot of things that people think are guy things are just people things. Can I add one thing? Oh, the lady, she said something about Black Widow, the movie. I'm wondering if how Lucy does this weekend. If Lucy's a really big hit, that's that'll be Black Widow being a basket. I mean, they'll definitely sure. make it there. I, I was just going to say to, to to add to what Heidi just said. If you want to, there. I don't think the studios are stupid. I think they're intransigent, but I don't think they're stupid. And I think if they they want to see this market continue, they want to see it grow. And right now, the. The way I look at it, I don't have any graphics. Sorry, I didn't bring any slides. So here's my slide. The geek market is this, and it's mostly skewed to historical norms in the geek market. Superheroes, you know, the male icons, things like that. It could be this, but you need to be able to reach audiences and give them what they want, so like what women want, what, you know, more diverse characters. And you have to engage it organically. You have to give good creators who love that stuff. You have to give them the license to make it. And then you have to have smart studios to fund it. But yeah, by no means is this market tapped. But instead of looking up, you know, instead of having it be vertical growth, it really is horizontal growth. That's a, that's a good segue to the, um, if you want to see this conversation continued, we're going to be next door uh, um, in room uh, 26. Yeah, 20, uh, 25 for the Geeks Branding panel. Heidi and I are both on that panel along with uh, a bunch of other um, really smart folks who uh, to talk about this very specific yeah. issue of marketing and branding. We're people talking about it. Thank you for coming. Absolutely. Thank you very much.